the uh, uh, spotlight research was fun to watch for you all uh, i am anshuman chakravarti head of automation at contlo i'll just be going over the cue sheet one time uh, so that we're all aligned on who is going when jorge and i apologize for butchering your pronunciations in advance <laughs> but jorge goes first sri aditya devi goes second aditi singh goes third third nesta masli goes fourth michael de sheza goes fifth teja tolobandula goes sixth Siaxia Liu goes seventh, Ashman Mehra goes eighth, Viking Gu goes ninth, and Yuhan goes tenth. Uh, I think we're already ten minutes into the session that was supposed to start ten minutes back, so I'm going to have to be a little more strict about enforcing the fifteen-minute rule. Uh, so I'll be pinging you guys in chat. Just keep an eye out. Uh, but yeah, Jorge, the stage is yours. Thanks, Shuman. How many? How many? How much time do I have here? 15 minutes we'll go with 15 minutes for everyone yeah all right folks uh let me quickly go over what the uh, context of this year is right so we i mean the initial idea was to present uh, sigma it's a paper that was uh, published before and it was part of uh, my doctor research back at the center for computational finance and economic agents I'm, uh, my name is george falero i'm based in new york city I'm a principal and chief scientist at Optera Analytics. It's based in a beautiful midtown Manhattan here. But uh, we were trying to kind of give you guys a little bit of uh, insight in what's coming next after Sigma. And we're calling this new thing called Zeta, right? That's basically the same approach we use for, for the, the, the theory of enablers, taking into consideration AGI agents now, right? So. Um, So what's what's Sigma, right? Um, it's a language for large large scale collaboration and economics, right? It's a way that people can use that. Not only agents, but also humans can use that language to kind of collaborate across uh, multiple um, instances of uh, uh, research in crowd based research. And it was introduced in the 2017 paper. We have the link there, so you guys, I'm gonna probably gonna distribute those uh, those uh, slides. That link is what uh, is going to be referring back to the title of this presentation here. Right? So we're going to be extending this a little bit to bring in the idea of uh, uh, Zeta, right? I was part of my doctorate, doctorate search I mentioned before. We had uh, multiple pieces of doctorate that was uh, that there was a the encompassing idea of the theory of the enablers. We had the, the Sigma and also had Fracti that was the software platform for it. But those are different pieces. It's all available for search and research if you guys want to go more about this right um the theory en enablers is basically a framework a mental framework they divide this all the enablers for uh, crowd-based collaboration large scale into two types of uh, collaborate enablers the con cognitive and non-cognitive enablers right sigma is one of the non-cognitive enablers and multiple that's it is one of them that's the one we're talking about right It, it sigma is basically a, a knowledge knowledge representation process right it's a way to produce domain specific representations let's let's go more into what uh, this um um like i mentioned sigma it's a, like i said it's a mean language was or a corporate specific language or a domain specific language can set side representation right It's one of the on the on the research. It kind of came from the the idea that uh, to in order for you to define intelligence, we have to come from what we define as the five traits of intelligence, um, and that the representation is one of those traits, right? Um, the the way we can produce uh, domain specific representations is outlined in a process that we call generic representational process. That's also part of the thesis. And we give the steps in which you produce those. And every representation has specific, uh, what we call elements, right? First, they have to come with facets, contributions, and the structural constraints. And again, those are uh, mini languages or domain specific languages related to research of scientific ideas, right? To produce new ideas, to investigate, to plan, and so forth. Uh, con contributions in, in, in themselves, they have uh, three, what we call properties, right? Evidential properties, intrinsicality, and communication slash interaction, interaction, right? That's all described on the paper. The paper is not, if I'm not mistaken, is almost 20 pages long. So it's a lot of content in there. It's just like a, a nutshell description of what the Sigma is. Um, Sigma in its essence is a, is a, is a model, 
right? Any representation is an essence, it's just a model, right? Um, sigma specifically, it's a, uh, like I mentioned before, is a non-cognitive labor that's part of the theory of the labors, right? And um, it's specifically designed to support uh, crowd-based investigations, right? Things that would allow crowds to define, uh, differentiate between what's fact, factual evidence, and what's fake, right? So basically, that's what the, that's the whole idea of sigma is in. In more specifically, sigma is that idea of what the, of, a, of an investigation process that could be applied to economics. Because if you're doing research, for example, in bio, biology or research in mathematics, or researching in in astrophysics, you are not you're going to have to define a new representational model, right? Again, sigma is just for economics slash finance. What we are going to describe here is let's take a, a few steps forward with sigma and what the pragmatic representation on top of sigma looking at what financial market economics is right what a pragmatic pragmatic representation of sigma would look like if we had to adjust that to to the specific use of agis not crowds but agi agents right and that's what this talk here is going to be all about. Again, the slides here, you guys can see, I'm kind of using this from some other talk, right? So it's coming with um, with some extra bonus on this. Uh, important to move forward is to kind of uh, pin a few concepts in terms of what the, the scope of the conversation is here. This, this things in general, they're moving fairly fast. Um, ideas and concepts are changing. So let's pin down a few specifics we're using here, right? And first, first in terms of uh, what's an AGI agent to us, is an agent that acts in a, in, is in a, in an intelligent uh, manner, right? It has to perceive, act, and learn and improve with time, right? Um, it, it has the five intelligent traits, like uh, able to learn, it's able to reason, it's able to plan, communicate, not only in terms of sigma or whatever what other representation uh, the, the knowledge representation model we use, but in natural language, and and uh, in, in also supports one or more uh, uh, ways to represent that knowledge specific, like the meta representation. And the the sixth trait that we have to add is more like what we call like an integration trait, and that's the metacognitive uh, function. Right, is able to pick and choose depending on the situation which one of those traits they're going to be using in, term, in order to achieve or execute a specific task, right? For in this case here, we're talking about, if we're talking about an agent and the, uh, the intent of this agent is to, for example, uh, function as a, a market maker for a specific type of instrument, you should be able to decide and pick and choose between all of those traits to make sure that the task is assigned at that specific moment is, uh, is appropriate. Right, that same agent can later, instead of being like a market maker, it can become to be like a liquidity provider, a liquidity taker, and adjust as he moves and as he decides that would be the best um, uh, option for for his uh, function to be performed. But that's a, that's a, probably the most important trait is the metacognitive, the integration function. Right. Uh, the second thing, that in terms of concepts that we have to uh, I kind of touched on that in the, in the previous slides is a, a, a definition of what the representation is, right? Um, it's a, basically how we represent information and structure about the world that that specific agent sees, right? And in the paper, we kind of describe that. We talk about uh, different types of uh, uh, representations in which you, an agent is, it could be concerned in terms of uh, the example we're getting there. Is like you have uh, an agent that's interested in producing or interacting with architectural uh, concepts. He is going to be concerned about different aspects of the same reality than an agent that would be concerned about pricing specific instruments and so forth. So a representation is domain specific. It's a subset of the entire like uh, vision of what whatever the agent or entity has, and that's always geared toward the specific function. So we're going to talk about that um, later. Uh, uh, slides that the function of a agents is most often that's a proposition we're going to use here the hypothesis that it has to be the dichotomous meaning that in order for an agent to be 
uh, uh, complete. He has to not only be able to communicate in natural languages, and you can say like natural languages in the plural, right? But also be able to switch back and forth across representations based on the specific task that's being associated to him, right? We're gonna mention that as well. Um, you know, in, the, in terms of specifically sigma, I mentioned before, it's a representation that uses facets, contributions, and constraints. And again, I'm pointing back to the same paper. It's all described in there. You can, um, it's available in archive. And uh, the other thing that usually brings special in this, I'm not sure how much people are going to be interested in this specific point here, but economics in the scope of this research or this work here, it's, uh, it's basically defined in terms of two major concepts in kind of the no arbitrage principle and incentives, right? And the second thing is like finance and economics. Finance is considered to be a subset almost all encompassing domain of economics. So whenever I use finance or economics, think about those interchangeably, right? How much time do I have here? Because I know we, we started late up until the, when can we start to do the, okay. Okay, Zira. Um, it's a pragmatic, um, AGI for financial models in terms of a representation specifically, right? Let, let's talk about real, real world requirements we have for the domain which we apply this, uh, this, this solution here. It's uh, finance, right? And finance, in, 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 it has multiple facets, right? You have facets in which you are mostly going to be concerned about performance, right? So if you have a change and a, a price tick and your agent takes too long to make decisions or interact with other or, or, or switch between between um, uh, uh, modes. It's it's going to lose for simple like pro procedural uh, agents playing on the same landscape, right? And in terms of uh, especially finance and uh, high frequency finance, that space is taken by it's, it's it's pretty much a battleground. Folks are investing in time, cloud services, uh, uh, colocation of uh, engines, so performance is very important, right? The other requirement we have that a real world requirement for an agent to be successful in an environment like that would be accuracy, absolute accuracy in terms of uh, it's, it's not uh, in, in terms of uh, whatever when you define accuracy is important to be accurate in terms of the T uh, zero in which that specific event happened. If you are accurate looking at a reality that would be like a few milliseconds after that's not accurate anymore. That's wrong. It's another requirement it has to be aligned in terms of what the time and the perception perception of time is very relative, has to be viable economically, meaning um, there are companies that are spending tens of millions of dollars in, cluster, in, 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 in cloud services every single month just to allow for training and execution of their models. So if you spend $10 million a month in cloud services plus people that you have to pay for, and you still have to provide, be profitable by the end, on the end of that month at that quarter, how much profit that you have to bring in, right? So the economic viability is, an, is a subject, is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a portion of this, uh, this problem. It's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's very important, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's a real world requirement. The other thing that given the, the kinds of constraints we have with uh, the market and regulations it has to be explainable. It has to be liable because if you commit some mistake, we have to know where the mis mistake is coming from and everything has to be confidential. Um, whatever happens here in terms of what you're doing, you have to make sure that other players in the same market, they cannot detect uh, your patterns to use that against yourself, right? So, and that's what we come to what CETA is coming about as being a model, it's an agent that deals with multiples, multiple uh, presentations in two types. That's why we call it the complements of representation. One is like natural languages, it's one class of presentation. And the other one is in terms of uh, domain specific uh, representations. We're going to have domain specific representation of price, pricing, another one for risk, and so forth. So that agent speaks more than one language, and that language is, is um, represented by the, the structure of the, the knowledge uh, model he uses. Um, that's specific for Zeta. A natural representation not always preferred. Um, and by the end, I mean, 
oversimplifying here a little bit, it becomes like just a matter of um, it's a it's a mapping problem. It's a natural show domain specific language in plural and twin, right? Use a bound to specific yes. And the other, like I mentioned before, you're gonna have a specific domain language that's required for pricing. Another one required for for um, um, market making and so forth. Every function is gonna have a specific way to represent the function that you the the, the model that you're trying to represent there. Okay, um, I think that's it. Quick. Uh, the few things that a few points that I want to want to make here before we cut uh, first in terms of um, do you really need a general agent you know to be able to perform a very specific because functions in finance especially functions in the trading space of finance that's uh, they're very purpose specific they're very specific right so I have a specific function of trading risk market making would be more a matter of those agents being able to communicate them amongst themselves or being one super agent that knows how to behave in multiple uh, functions. That's one thing that uh, that's uh, one thing that uh, this decision point, something to be discussed, right? Uh, there are functions on that space that are more adequate for a, a more an, a, a purely or, or a full uh, AGI agent to perform, like uh, product engineering given specific requirements in terms of uh, legal and regulations and the mathematical definitions, how can you define a new basket of problems, products, for example, that's very specific. And then you have to deal with multiple domains of knowledge that mostly defined in terms of uh, natural languages to provide one final output. The same thing in terms of uh, compliance review, knowing that specific, specific um, um, Parts of your model that are compliant or not. Fraud or money laundry surveillance is another one that's more AGI, AGI um, uh, friendly. Um, and the other thing is like, uh, is that even viable at all? If you consider all the variables I mentioned before, especially in terms of uh, um, uh, economic viability, right? If it's viable or not, if you were able to explain what your agent is going to be doing always beforehand. In terms of confidentiality and accuracy, is that an AGI engine always a solution in finance? That's something that's probably the answer is no. Um, and to know more, we can um, can check this um, the paper that I started this whole discussion. Sigma, a language for large scale collaboration in economics. That's uh, that's it. Thanks, Jorge. Lovely presentation. Um, what was also great to watch in the uh, spotlight research was some good engagement happening in the chat. So if you guys have any questions, uh, if there's any discussions that you want to uh, start, the chat on the right hand side would be a great place to do it. Thanks, Jorge. Uh, it was lovely having you. All right, you. folks. Enjoy Thank you. this Thanks quick for this around show. and hang out or check out any of the other stages if you'd like, Jorge. Thank you. So according to the, the queue sheet, Sri Aditya Devi is up next. Whenever you're ready, I'm just going to call you on stage. Well, you are on stage. So yeah, whenever you're ready. Yep, uh, I'll just share my screen. Uh, so are you able to see my screen? All right, uh, let's get started. Uh, so hello, everyone. I'm Sri Aditya. Uh, I'm a recent graduate uh, from Caltech and an incoming scientist at um, Indian Space Research Organization. So in this presentation, I'm going to introduce our work on RGBX object detection via scene-specific fusion modules. So this is a joint work between uh, Ford Motor Company and Caltech's ARCL lab, led by Professor Sunja Chang. Uh, so yeah. Um, so detecting objects uh, such as vehicles, pedestrians, uh, and traffic lights is vital for autonomous vehicles on the road. So in recent years, uh, with the availability of uh, large-scale annotated data sets, 
uh, vision based object detection models have achieved like impressive results so however uh, as rgb cameras are highly dependent on lighting and visibility vision based object detection remains challenging in adverse weather conditions uh, so modern auto autonomous vehicles are usually equipped with multiple sensors with uh, different pros and cons including uh, rgb camera lidar radar and other supplementary sensors such as thermal camera uh, it's important to note that no single sensor modality is robust to uh, all possible conditions that may be encountered during driving so uh, fusing uh, sensory measurements in different mo modalities uh, provides an effective way uh, to improve the system redundancy and the robustness of uh, object detection models so there are three types of uh, deep sensor fusion mechanisms commonly used in the literature so the first is uh, the early fusion approach which fuses uh, raw sensor measurements in different modalities and then processes the fused uh, measurements together the next one is the middle level fusion where the fusion happens at the feature level and finally uh, we have the uh, late fusion approach where the fusion happens uh, uh, at the detection stage where we basically fuse the detection results from individual fusion modules uh, for example, bonding boxes so among the three mechanisms deep sensor fusion on the feature level offers uh, greater flexibility and generally shows better performance um yeah uh, however so there are also challenges in such fusion mechanisms so fusing at the feature level usually uh, results in densely interconnected uh, neural network architecture therefore it requires a large scale uh, co registered multimodal training data that is uh, hard to obtain so it also requires extensive training time uh, whenever a sensor component uh, needs to be changed so in the light of these challenges in this work uh, we propose an efficient rgb x fusion network that can leverage uh, detection models pre trained on abundant single modal data sets and uh, reduce the requirement of these uh, co registered multimodal data sets uh, from training all parameters to only training lightweight fusion modules so this design offers the possibility of having uh, multiple sets of fusion parameters for different scene uh, which in this case uh, weather conditions uh, to bring scene adaptability so as a result uh, our model achieves superior performance over object detection uh, methods on rgb thermal and rgb gated data sets uh, as well as uh, comparable results with 75% less co registered multimodal training data so for the implementation uh, we uh, oh sorry i think yeah for the implementation we use uh, uh, efficient dead architecture with the efficient uh, backbone and a uh, by fpn trained on single model training data so during training we keep the pre trained parameters frozen and train several scene specific fusion modules uh using uh, co registered images from different scene categories uh, for instance from daytime nighttime overcast and fog so we also use a pre trained detector head to further reduce the training parameters our fusion module consists of uh, several convolutional block attention uh, modules uh, to fuse uh, multi modal features at various by fpn stages specifically we concatenate thermal and rgb features output from respective uh, by fpns um, the concatenated uh, feature maps uh, go through channel attention module and then a spatial attention module finally we use a 2d convolutional uh, layer to revert the feature size to the original uh, single model feature size um, in addition we also train a scene classifier uh, on rgb features considering uh, the high variance of uh, rgb images under different uh, scene categories so during inference uh, the scene classifier outputs the probabilities of the current scene categories uh, so given the image uh, we use a classification result that is the highest probability entry um, as an indicator to select the scene specific uh, uh, module for multimodal feature fusion 
this uh, online future uh, fusion module selection allows the model to choose uh, the optimal set of parameters for the current scene resulting in a scene adaptive uh, fusion module with just a small overhead um, okay now uh, we show some of the uh, notable quantitative and qualitative results of our method uh, compared with the state of the art rgbx fusion modules for object detection um, on three uh, multimodal data sets. Uh, so first, we achieved the uh, best RGB thermal object uh, detection performance on clear aligned data set for all object categories, namely uh, person, bike, and car. So here, the scene agnostic CBAM basically refers to a model with only one set of uh, fusion modules trained on images from all scene categories. So the large margin of our scene agnostic uh, model over the existing approaches shows the advantage of our method in leveraging pre-trained single model data uh, And also our scene adaptive model further improves the performance of our scene agnostic models. So this clearly shows its adaptable ability for various scenes. So uh, our fusion modules uh, uh, have also had a superior performance on RGB gated detection on Seeing through fog uh, of the STF multimodal data set. Here are some uh, visualized detection results for the six different scene categories uh, showed along with the ground truth uh, bonding boxes, ranging from uh, uh, clear day to snow night. Uh, so we found that a scene adaptive model generally works better than the scene agnostic model on harsh weather conditions, uh, such as dense fog and snow. Uh, but they perform similarly on clear day images. Yeah, so here are some uh, some more quantitative uh, qualitative results on the m qubit FD data set uh, for RGB thermal detections with zoomed in uh, visualizations. Also, we further visualize the learned channel attention of different scene specific fusion modules. Uh, uh, we basically plot the normalized attention weights for all feature channels in the trained uh, CBAM parameters. Uh, so the pattern of uh, increasing reliance of thermal features over RGB features from day to challenging scenes uh, support our idea of having different uh, fusion modules for different uh, scene conditions. Lastly, we conducted an experiment uh, or an ablation study uh, on the effect of uh, the training data size on the detection performance. So in this experiment, we trained our fusion module using 100%, 50%, 25%, and 1% of the original data sets. As a result, we found that uh, competitive results can still be achieved uh, by just using 25% uh, of the training data. So this shows that our approach uh, has reduced the reliance on co-registered uh, multimodal training data. So to conclude our work, uh, I presented an RGBX uh, object detection framework that fuses uh, uh, pre-trained single model networks using uh, lightweight fusion modules. So uh, in summary, our approach basically reduces the dependence on hard to obtain uh, co-registered RGBX datasets, reduces fusion training time when sensors or pre-trained pre networks are swapped out, and uh, uh, it provides improved adaptability via scene-specific uh, fusion modules. So I, I request anyone interested to please refer our paper and GitHub repository for more details. Lastly, I'd like to also acknowledge the Ford Motor Company for funding our work. Um, yeah, and thanks for attending. Uh, and I'll answer any of your questions in the chat. Yep. Sure, I think we're doing great on time so far. Thanks, Sri Aditya Devi. Um, yeah. Next up, I think, uh, according to the queue sheet, we have Nestor Masley. Nestor, take it away. If you're on stage, there you are. Hello, how's it going? Um, pleasure to be here today. I'm just going to share my screen. All right, so I'm very excited to be here today, and I'm going to be presenting 
on general trends that occur in the world of AI as told by the 2023 AI index. So for those of you that are not familiar, the AI index is a report that comes out once a year that tells a story of significant trends that are occurring in the world of AI. And the report has been around now for seven years or so. It was funded originally and created in 2017. And it emerged because there was a group of influential AI thought leaders like Eric Brynjolfsson and Yoav Shoam. Eric, who is probably one of the world's leading economists on AI, and Yoav, who's a distinguished Stanford computer scientist and one of the co-founders of AI21, which is a major AI company. Both of these individuals realized that AI was potentially going to be a game-changing technology. And as such, it was very kind of important and essential to have a report that tracked progress in the field and had a report that could look at what's happening in AI from a diversity of perspectives. And that's really what the AI index does. It looks at trends in AI from technical perspectives. So what can the technology do now that it couldn't do five years ago? It looks at trends from ethical perspectives. So what are overarching ethical concerns that people should be aware of? And it also looks at trends from research and development perspectives, but really anything you would want to know about AI, its effect on the economy, its relationship to policy, its relationship to public opinion, all of that information is contained and can be found in the report. I lead the production of the report with my associate, Laura Donna, but again, the report is itself supervised by a diverse committee of AI experts. We also work with a lot of independent researchers and contractors, and we also collaborate with different vendors, companies like LinkedIn, NetBase Quid, Google, CRA, all of these companies give us data that we then use in the report that enables us to draw some of the high level conclusions that we, we do. So what I'm gonna kind of endeavor to do today in <clears throat> this presentation is really distill some of the key findings of the report, which is it's quite long as 400 pages, into 10 essential highlights, 10 kind of key takeaways that I think really paint a key picture of what's going on in the field of AI. So first is that industry races ahead of academia. So if you look at data on where some of these new significant machine learning systems are coming from, the majority of them are increasingly coming from industry sources instead of academia sources. You'll notice that since 2014, <clears throat> industry has really taken over as the predominant source of models, whereas once it used to be academic institutions. You might be wondering, like, why is this the case? What gives? Is it the case that industry is hiring better talent? Is it the case that people in industry are simply more motivated? We speculate that it mostly has to do with resources and that large language models, these kind of frontier AI systems are getting bigger and increasingly more expensive. This chart is looking at the estimated training cost of select large language models. And you'll notice that certain models like GPT-2, which were precursors to GPT-4, cost around $50,000 to train. Whereas if you fast forward to 2022, you have certain models like Palm costing in the range of $8 million. <clears throat> We're actually in the process of updating this data for next year's report, and we estimate that some new models like GPT-4 and Gemini cost anywhere from $100 to $150 million to train. And again, part of the reason that these systems cost so much money to train is because it was discovered in 2017 that you can feed these systems increasingly larger amounts of data. And if you give them more and more data, they become increasingly increasingly good at a lot of these tasks. So what a lot of these companies have done is simply kind of scaled these systems on increasingly greater amounts of data. It's also the case that new AI PhDs are increasingly heading to industry. So if you look at 2010, there was roughly a similar number of AI PhDs that would go to industry versus academia. Whereas if you fast forward to 2021, there appears to be a pretty massive and substantial gap that has opened up. The second highlight, which is that we've seen a lot of performance saturation on traditional benchmarks. So a benchmark in the AI community is a way to kind of measure AI progress and basically a way to see how well or how good AI systems are at doing different kinds of tasks. And you'll notice that on this chart, there is way more blue than there is purple. 
Blue is looking at the overall improvement on a select benchmark since it launched, and Purple is looking at the year-over-year -year improvement. <clears throat> and the fact that there's way more Purple, sorry, Blue, than there is Purple is indicative of the fact that on a lot of these traditional benchmarks, AI performance has become increasingly saturated. So as a research community, we need harder and more challenging tests as a means of kind of measuring what AI is actually capable of doing. The third highlight is that AI is both helping and harming the environment. There's really interesting data that looks at the energy savings of certain experiments like Bee Cooler, where DeepMind basically gave a reinforcement learning agent the ability to kind of modulate the cooling levels in a building. And you'll notice that over the course of three months, the experiment was able to save around 13% energy. At the same time, however, there's evidence that AI can also harm the environment. Certain models like GPT-3, Gopher, and Bloom have fairly large computational and carbon footprints. And given the fact that these models are increasingly scaling as time goes on, it's going to be increasingly important and necessary for people to track the carbon emission trends of some of these models in the future. The fourth highlight really kind of speaks to the fact that AI is increasingly being used in scientific settings and really being used to drive very exciting scientific progress. So in 2022, there was a lot of examples about how AI was used to accelerate science in different ways. AI was used to, for example, optimize nuclear fusion experiments. Nuclear fusion can potentially be a limitless source of clean energy, but it's something that's traditionally very hard to do because it requires access to a lot of resources. Researchers from DeepMind were able to train a reinforcement learning algorithm that really accelerated the possibility of doing nuclear fusion. It's also the case that there's opportunities to discover new matrix manipulation algorithms. Matrix manipulation was also a process that had bedeviled and really challenged a lot of scientists. DeepMind developed algorithms to solve some of these manipulations in easier ways. And AI could also be used to unlock de novo antibody designs. So there's a lot of different kind of ways in which AI could be used and developed. It's also the case that AI has started to build better AI. So companies like NVIDIA have trained reinforcement learning agents that basically <clears throat> operate to build better GPU chips, the GPU chips being the very things that power and kind of move forward AI systems. On the ethical side, another big highlight is that the number of incidents that concern the misuse of AI are rapidly rising. This chart comes to us from the AI AIC repository and it looks at the number of AI-related incidents and controversies, and you'll notice the number of such incidents has really skyrocketed since 2012, reflecting both the growing awareness of this technology and the fact that this technology is becoming increasingly socially integrated. It's also the case that generative models have arrived and really so have their ethical problems. If you go to a, 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 a pretty predominant and prominent AI model like Midjourney, and you ask it, this being, of course, a text-to-image model to generate an image of an influential person, it's going to give you an image of four white dudes. We did ask it that prompt a second time, and it did give us one woman, but that still seemed to be kind of quite rare for the model. And then if you ask the model someone who is intelligent, you're going to get four images of Albert Einstein. It's also the case that a lot of these models can be tricked into building bombs, and in general, ethical concerns are much more kind of salient now than they were before. The sixth highlight is that the demand for AI-related professional skills is increasing across virtually every American industrial sector. So we have data in the report from Lightcast that basically compares the number of AI-related job postings in the United States by sector in 2021 versus 2022. And you'll notice that there is a substantially greater amount of such job postings in 2022 than 2021, which is suggestive of the fact that employers are increasingly looking for workers with AI skills. Now, we only have this data for people that are in the United States, but you would imagine that if you would extrapolate, this data would also be applied to other settings as well. The seventh highlight, and perhaps a surprising one for some people, is that for the first time in the last decade, year-over-year -year private investment in AI decreased. 
So if you look at global corporate investment in AI by investment activity, you'll find that there was less investment in 2022 than there was in 2021. And we don't necessarily speculate why that's the case, but it's hard not to imagine that this had something to do with the fact that there was a lot less a lot less of a, let's say, conducive investment climate. Interest rates were substantially higher. Still, the amount of AI investment in 2022 is much greater than it was in 2013. The eighth highlight is that while the proportion of companies that adopted AI has plateaued, the companies that have actually adopted AI continue to pull ahead. So if you look at data from McKinsey, the number of organizations that report using AI in at least one function has plateaued at a state fairly level at 50%, whereas there is data, however, from people that actually use AI in their business processes, that AI is actually tangibly leading to cost decreases and revenue increases across a diversity of activities. The ninth highlight is that policymaker interest in AI is on the rise. Policymakers across the globe are becoming increasingly interested in artificial intelligence, with certain countries like the United States, Russia, the United Kingdom, and Canada leading as places where a lot of bills are being passed. And then the 10th highlight is that Chinese citizens are among those who feel the most positively about AI products and services, whereas Americans really not so much. So if you look at data from Ipsos that is asking citizens, you know, products and services using AI have more benefits than drawbacks, to what, to what degree do you agree with this? Chinese citizens are much more likely to agree with that in comparison to American ones. And as AI becomes increasingly ubiquitous and increasingly deployed in society, it is going to become more and more important to understand and evaluate how AI public opinion changes over time. If you also look at what kinds of things people are most concerned about, it tends to be things like jobs and privacy um, and, and bias. Those are the kind of issues that people are most worried about. We're, of course, already working on next year's AI index. And I think there's a couple of things that are worth highlighting that you've had new models like GPT-4 that are increasingly pushing the frontier and leading to better and improved performance. And there's also a lot more evidence that AI can make you a lot more productive. Companies that are using AI are starting to see much better performance gains than those that are not. So that concludes my presentation. I thank you guys for giving me the time to, to speak today on trends in AI. I'll be happy to answer any questions if there are any questions for the audience, but otherwise I'm happy to hand it on and pass the baton to the next person in the roster. Thanks, Nesta. I was waiting for someone to talk about ethics in AI. Uh, but yeah, lovely presentation, uh, lovely virtual background too. Aditi Singh, you're up next. Can you hear me? Hello. Okay, thank you so much. So I'll just um, start. Oh, hello, welcome uh, everyone. Um, I'm Aditi Singh and uh, I'll be just presenting like a quick survey of how um, I just explored around like the AI text to image and AI text to video generators. Pretty much uh, there have been like Every day we wake up and there is a new video model or there's another new model. So pretty much I started with like the initial models, like what they were and how uh, they started. Uh, so in my, this quick review, I started with like AI text to image generators and uh, the AI text to video generators. Pretty much uh, we can say that we are trying to generate images and videos just from those textual descriptions. Somewhere these are using natural language processing. Um, the whole idea is to make sure that the content creation process can be automated. And down the line, we're looking this in the field of education, entertainment, and marketing. To be honest, like um, marketing would be an ideal scenario because that's where the stock images are being created all across. So that's where these uh, text to image would be helpful. And if I talk about text to video, the same place, the stock market, stock images uh, again. 
So to be honest, like the limitation and challenges around all the generation of AI text to image or text to video would be towards the requirement for a larger database because there is a possibility or risk of misinterpretation or misrepresentation. And um, I'll just show you in a minute what misinterpretation or misrepresentation I'm talking about. But um, another uh, challenge towards this generation process is with increase in demand, every single time these models are going towards the training process, there's lots and lots of computation. Let's say there's just 64 by 64 pixel of image. In order to convert that image to let's say another image, there could be let's say thousands of conversions, thousands of noises being added. There could be multiple Markov chain models involved there. So right over here, I'll just start with text to image uh, generators. These are pretty much using any deep learning models like uh, diffusion models, generative adversarial networks, or variational autoencoders. So the representation which I was talking about uh, as a challenge could be my example of this one. So right over here, the representation such as NERS could be in different uh, images in terms of could be a gender bias, could be any representational bias. And in terms of computation, you can look at all these uh, dog images on sitting on earth, all of these images looks good, but what about the computation? How many models were trained in order to get this particular image? That's the computation cost we are talking about. So in my survey, again, uh, I'll be honest, this was just initial uh, initial models which I was going around, which is Quark, View, Dali2, and Imogen. And around these, I just went over the architectures, but let's be honest there, every day we are seeing something new. Uh, and that's the next part of my presentation, which is, uh, comparing the AI text to video models, or generator models. So all these models require huge training because let's be honest, we are just putting, let's, let's see the real scenario, just passing some random text and we are trying to generate images based upon that. The images could be generated in fast, it could generate like DALI2 is comparing like um, visual images, different prompts, and pretty much we are looking around uh, the easiness or the interpretation. Somewhere we want the images to be produced directly related to the prompt which we have been asking. Uh, and that becomes a challenge when we look around this text to video generator. So this is another set of survey which I did. And it was again around how the text to video generators are working. They are also pretty much based upon the diffusion models, RNN, um, or transformers. They are used to analyze and generate video content. The popular AI text to video at the time when I did the survey was make a video, image and video, Pinaki Go, Dive and Cogview. To be honest, right now, I can add a number of uh, those generators, such as Runaway or Sora. Those are things which, if I have to uh, start a survey again, I would definitely would love to include those because they are typically based upon those diffusion models. In terms of concerns around these generator models, the same thing, the computational cost, because right now we are starting or we are analyzing the thermodynamics of physics and how each and every system is trying to be represented. Let's say there is a beaker of water and you're trying to spill a color on it. In our video, what we are doing is we would love to see how that particular red color gets dissolved in the video. And that's pretty much what these models have to represent. They have to represent what other format or what all state transitions are going to place. So that increases our computational cost and it requires all this con content consistency because the recent text to video generator, which is Sora, we've seen that there were cubs of, um, uh, the fox cubs were trying to come around without, uh, they were just increasing in number in the video. So that was kind of the, inconsistency in this text to video generator. And somewhere we know that these videos, they are right now being able to, uh, for let's say like five seconds or maybe one minute, but over the period of time, I'll not be surprised that 
within one year we may be able to making like short videos up to 30 minutes or having different advertising done across the globe so that's what these could be useful and again there are limitations with all these videos because the association with text that association between each frame that could be required that is limited right now and all these top notch uh, video generators i uh, runaway is another video generator which um, is again very much uh, beneficial or can be used again for generating like 60 second video or something. So that's where all these video generators, they do follow our transformer or encoder, decoder, diffusion models. These are pretty much trained on different variety of data. They have somewhere or the other, they have computational costs, which increases and reduces depending upon how long the videos are being made. And it is an open-ended question. Like, do we want to make movies out of these AI texts to video generators? Do we want to write the whole script and then see how the... So that's something I believe in long run that could be a perfect use case. But again, the representation, the misinterpretation, that has to be taken care of. And that again requires back to our computational cost. Um, so pretty much if I just go over the summary or uh, my talk, it kind of summarizes all this text to video and text to uh, image generators, their different model types, their advantages, their limitations. Uh, down the line, I would say that uh, I've been comparing or every day I'm tracking like what is the new model coming up because every single day you would see with limited number of training data, with limited number of, let's say, our architecture, there's a new model in there. And how it is working, the concepts are kind of changing every day with the video getting bigger or smaller. Down the line, we want, a, uh, we want to use these text to image and text to video generator for movie creation, for educational uh, tutorial. And that's where I think, uh, the world would go over. So that's basically my talk. And um, I am uh, I would like to conclude. Thank you so much. That's my email. If there's any question, please let me know. Thanks, Aditi. Lovely presentation. I hope you get to your class on time. Thank you so much. Yes, I'm just running away. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thank you again. Bye. Uh, Bye, Bye. So I think Michael and Teja have not made it to the event yet. And I think Siaxia is ready to go. Uh, if Michael, if and when Michael and Teja join back, uh, we'll be happy to accommodate them. Over to you. Hi, could you unmute yourself, please? I think you're on mute. We can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Can you, can you see? Can you see my? Yeah, we can see you. Oh, we can't see you anymore. Perfect. Oh, no, it's good. okay. It's good. It's good. It's good. Perfect. We can see and hear you clear and loud. Uh. You can go ahead. Sorry. Right. I will show I will show now. Okay, you see. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> so <laughs> so good afternoon everyone. I'm honored to be invited to participate in this exciting gather. My name is Liu Xiaoxia, a second year PhD student from Zhejiang University. And today I will be presenting our research titled Prompting Frameworks for Large Language Models, a survey. So, 
since the release of OpenAI's ChatGPT, a powerful AI chatbot, it has sparked considerable social in, uh, interest. Like language models like GPT-4 and Llama has made impressive uh, advancements in academia and industry. So bring fundamental changes to various fields, including education, healthcare, law, finance, and more. So the flourish development of large language models has undergone a series of evolutions from fully supervised learning to deep learning for NLP and now to the paradigm shift from pre-trained fine-tune to pre-trained prompt predict. So therefore, how to correct stimulate large lang language models and whether simpler and more convenient ways of interacting with them can be used become crucial concerns for uh, practitioners, practitioners and developers. So, okay, next page. So despite the remarkable capabilities demonstrated by large language models, their inherent uh, limitation in practical applications are undeniable. So first, existing LMMs suffer from significant temporal lag of training data. So for instance, ChatGPT's last training data was up to January 2022. So that would result in bears and limitations due to the audit training data. Consequently, LMMs may struggle to accurately understand specific terms or domain knowledge and occasionally produce error or inaccurate an uh, inaccurate response. So additionally, RMs like access to real-time information such as the current time or status. And secondly, RMs like the physical ability to directly prompt for or uh, perform external operations. So such as web search, database retrieval, or use physical device like robotic arms. So similar to humans, RM can be seen as a brain of AI system, so just like the brain in a wet. So, uh, in conclusion, the development of tools that not only empower large language models, but also help in optimizing and simplifying the interaction process with LMs has become crucial. And prompting frameworks is a framework for managing, simplifying, and facilitating interaction with large language models, which adhere to four essential properties. So uh, it's modularity, uh, abstraction, extensible, and standard. So specifically like the figure in, on the right. So modality is uh, breaking down the structure of prompting framework into independent models. So for ease of code management and reuse and abstraction provides high level simplified interface in the design of the prompting framework to hide complex impl uh, implement implementation uh, details. And extensibility allows users to feasibly customize and extend the functionality of the framework as need. And standard ensure consistency in development to imp improve code ma uh, maintainability and readability. So uh, we categorize the uh, interaction between LMs and the en uh, external entities use a prompting framework into four levels. Uh, the data level, the base level, the execute level, and the service level. So the prompting framework serves as a facilitator for interlayer communication and interlayer, inter uh, interlayer scheduling. It's, or it's worth not noting that the interaction between different layers are non-linear. That is during the execution of a single task, data may propagate back and forth between layers to accomplish com uh, complex operations. So in data layer, the prompting framework ensures unified processing of various diff uh, data types, and the the base level serves as the computational center between the data and the, the execution layer, like a brain or CPU. And the execute layer uh, inter interacts with the la uh, language models through the prompting frameworks to accomplish practical t uh, tasks, coordinating model configurates and calls to achieve task completion. And service level, 
atop the business workflow, serve to manage, schedule, and integrate advanced tasks in specific domains. So uh, we consider it we considering the uh, technical characteristics, design objectives, and application scenarios. We categorize existing or uh, prompting frameworks into three types: the shelf large language models and the language for interaction with LMs and the, the output restrictors of LMs. So the timeline for this category is on the left. And the principle behind designing prompting frameworks is to facilitate the interaction between LMs and the external world. Different types of prompting frameworks manifest the enhancement effort from different perspectives. So we will not give a detailed explanation. So uh, first, we introduce the first type of prompting frameworks, the shelf LMs. So also, we know that the super AGI is uh, belong to this, uh, this type. And like a shell or interface in computer sy systems, the shelf LMs inference interaction with LMs by facilitating their engagement with highly capable third parties, thereby enable stronger interaction between LMs, users, and external models. So we categorize it into two subtypes, so called uh, universal LMSH and domain specific LMSH. And next one. We will introduce the language for interaction with LMs. Uh, for uh, there are primarily two categories. So programming LM, LNG, LNG primarily involves designing a new programmable language for interaction with LMs by simulate, uh, simulate, simulating the syntax and architecture of exist, existing programming languages. And sudo LM LNG is a more open-ended uh, form that flexibility combined natural language with structured coding. So relying on the uh, inherent capability of LMs, which is like uh, scratching out your ideas before diving into detailed coding. So the last one, as for the output re resistor of LMs, content LM RSTR focus on achieving controllable generation by LMs in streaming aspect. Uh, uh, privacy protecting security and alignment with the top a topic and accuracy. And structure LM ISTR plays a crucial role in uh, information processing, data managing, and uh, decision support. So enable both computers and humans to better understand and utilize the information. Okay. So next we conduct a Compar uh, comparative uh, analyze of mainstream pr prompting frameworks focus on these three numerical uh, dimensions. So that is um, compat uh, compatibility, uh, capability and features. And the last one is documentation and support. So, okay, we primarily consider two aspects. Uh, compatibility, uh, compatibility of programming language and compatibility with LMs. So first, various prompting frameworks often provide interfaces support, supporting one or multiple mainstream prom or programming language. So allowing, uh, so allow developers to flexibility choose and interact with language in different projects and environment. So thereby. Enhancing development efficiency and adaptation. Uh, second, one of the key requirements for the prompting framework is its capability with LMs. So, which means that the prompting framework should uh, seamlessly integrate, uh, integrate with various type of LMs and handle their input and output correctly. So, uh, next we. Uh, compare and analyze prominent frameworks for the spect, uh, perspective of capabilities and features. So capabilities and features are important dimension because they directly determine the framework's uh, ability and flexibility in uh, problem solving and meet users' needs.
So we elaborate on various key stage of interaction between LMs and prompting frameworks, so including data pre-processing, uh, interface process, output control, cost uh, considerations, and tool learning, and the last one is information maintenance. So first is the capability of handling uh, unconventional con uh, cont contents. So and is the, the benefit of prompting frameworks for elements in the reasoning process. So uh, let's briefly go through it. Next are control of elements output and impact of calling costs. And the last one is maintenance of historical, uh, historical information. Uh, so last but not least is the capability of utilize, uh, utilizing external tools. The ability to use tools is one of the most significant distinctions between human and other spe uh, species. So typical elements are generalized models. So the capability for elements to utilize external tools holds significant importance for enhancing their uh, functionalities, adapting to specific tasks and domain requirements. So providing access to more data and resource support and meet uh, compliance and security uh, demands. So uh, for the last one, the documentation and support, uh, the rapid uh, proliferation of LMs and their uh, derivatives needs frequent updates to technical documents. So. Um, these updates may occur daily, so to uh, accommodate more products and features. Uh, introducing new features sometimes renders old features unusable or introduce errors, so posing significant challenge to use uh, to users and developments. So there, uh, therefore, the continuous addition of features and product introductions may make the documentation structure complex and the content increasingly lengthy. So uh, the re results of our compression of the ex uh, existing mainstream uh, prompting frameworks are shown in the figure. So we will anal analyze the results uh, based on our evalu uh, evaluation below. So, so there, uh, we will analyze the challenge and opportunity uh, opportunities that prompting frameworks currently face in terms of functionalities, uh, implementation, and issues related to security and ethics. So for a developed tool, both functionalities and security mechanism are equally important. So software that cannot be ensure user uh, information security and society uh, uh, harmlessness, so regard uh, regardless of its powerful features, cannot gain user support. So existing evidence suggests that both LMs and relative machine uh, prompting frameworks such as Longchain have um, certain uh, have certain security issues. So however, uh, existing prompting frameworks may pay little attention to the significance of security, ethic, and privacy pro uh, protecting. So therefore, we believe that the security mechanism uh, of prompting frameworks usually need to strengthen should include two parts. Uh, one is def uh, defense against prompt-based uh, attacks, and uh, the next one is prompt uh, pro uh, protection of LMs uh, behavior. So on the other hand, when comparing and analyzing the capabilities and features of prompting frameworks, we have divided them into six dimensions. The performance of prompting frameworks on this capability dimension is commendable, but there are still shortcomings in the implementation of uh, each capability dimension, so such as increasing steep learning curves and uh, constraints in intelligently invoke external interface. So. Uh, we believe that the next generation of prompting frameworks should integrate the strengths of the uh, three types of prompting frameworks. So establish sound security and privacy protection mechanism. So provide uh, concise and compact interaction channels and facilitate LMs interaction with powerful third party uh, interface and enable uh, interactions with high quality. And finally, integrate LMs with prompting frameworks to create an organic LM uh, ecosystem. So, 
Um, our paper also introduced other parts, but due to the time constraint, constraints, we don't elaborate on them here. So further details are available in our papers. We sincerely looking forward to your attention and a lovely uh, discussion. So, so, uh, so please share good prompting frameworks with us. The newest version is coming soon. So thanks so much. Have a nice day. Hello. Thanks, really well done. Uh, please stick around uh -huh. for the rest of the presentations too. Uh, and feel free to drop a few comments on the chat or questions if you have any. Thanks. Uh, Michael and Teja, welcome back to the session. Uh, Michael, if it's okay with you, Teja would want to go first uh, right now. So if that's okay, just drop a thumbs up in the chat uh, and we can go ahead with Teja's presentation. Okay, we'll take that as a yes. <laughs> uh, so Teja, whenever you're ready, you can start. Uh, I'll just put you on the stage. There you are. Awesome, looking good. Okay, um, so okay, I'll get started. Uh, uh, thanks uh, so much for the opportunity to present. Uh, so I am uh, going to talk about dynamic on-demand scheduling, uh, or basically crowd shipping, uh, using a certain technique, uh, which is basically double uh, during deep queue network, uh, with some enhancements. And that's why there's a long uh, name in the title. Uh, the enhancements are some something to do with constraints in the problem, and something to do with uh, you know uh, mixing deep queue learning with uh, heuristics. So let me set the uh, problem context a little bit. Uh, before that, it, this is joint work with uh, Nahid and Bo, who are also my colleagues uh, at the University of uh, Illinois, Chicago. OK, so let me set the problem uh, context. So I'm going to, so this is an applied um, uh, talk. So I'm going to talk about the problem and then look at, uh, um, as, you know, not specifically AGI or Gen, Gen AI model, but basically. Uh, enhancements in deep reinforcement learning and how can we use that uh, to kind of address this, uh, this uh, give a solution to this problem. So what is the problem? Uh, the problem is about crowd shipping, uh, which is a which is the problem of uh, assigning uh, deliveries uh, using ordinary individuals, uh, making these deliveries to uh, various um, you know locations and so on. Okay. So why crowd shipping? Uh, crowd shipping is uh, is a great solution to the rapidly growing e-commerce uh, as well as um, related areas in the United States and elsewhere. Um, and here are some numbers about how much uh, the growth has happened over the past five years. Uh, there is a time-sensitive nature to this problem, and that's why a centralized way to kind of uh, do this delivery is, is pretty hard to do. Uh, and there's a huge time, time pressure on the um, delivery service providers. And, and lastly, uh, if you use a single, uh, if you use large uh, delivery, delivery solutions like uh, trucks, for example, there's uh, there's a negative externality externality to them, uh, and so you know the alternative is to see if uh, you can achieve crowd shipping using uh, ordinary individuals uh, in a, a gig economy like setting. Okay, so that's the problem context, and now how does it relate to um, some tools that we know uh, in, uh, uh, in in machine learning, right? So uh, before we get to the tool or the solution, I want to set the specific uh, mathematical version of the problem, which is uh, there's a bunch of crowdsourcies. Uh, they dynamically arrive and leave, and the requests, which also arrive and leave in the system. And all we need to do is to just assign these requests to sub crowdsourcies. Okay? So with some objective in mind, um, uh, it's, a, it's a decision making problem. And the constraints are that, obviously, crowdsourcies have some capacity constraint. Uh, they also have time availability constraint. and uh, uh, you also have you know, requests need to be fulfilled within a couple of hours of placing and so on. So think of a gross, you know, think of a, uh, a delivery from a restaurant. Then you don't want to put the food to arrive like five hours later, right? So there's some constraints. 
Uh, how we're gonna attack this problem is, uh, as I said, the the Darcy problem, and we're gonna try to assign requests to crowdsources. And how are we gonna do that? Uh, very naturally, we're gonna break the problem uh, over the day, which happens over the day, into uh, you know sub problems. Okay, these problems are gonna be solved periodically. So we're just gonna resolve the problem uh, depending on what's the situation to you know at that point of time. So at that point of time, there'll be some crowdsources who are free, some crowdsources who are uh, delivering things uh, partially. And there will be potentially new requests. So we're going to just do this matching of requests to crowdsources. That's what we're going to do. And uh, how are we going to do uh, is that we're going to use uh, deep reinforcement learning. Okay. So we, and, and while you doing that, while applying deep reinforcement learning, we'll see that there are a couple of gaps, and we fill that gap, uh, fill those gaps. Okay. So there's uh, there's not much literature on applying deep reinforcement learning uh, in this particular problem, although. Uh, DRL has been used for many uh, combinatorial optimization problems, and this is one of it's this is one of those types of problems. Um, uh, most of those combinatorial problems tend to be static, uh, and so uh, as in the information doesn't change, whereas in our setting, uh, people come and leave, requests come and leave, so there is a dynamicism in this problem. And uh, what we do is uh, kind of fill those gaps that I was talking about. So we pick up a deep reinforcement learning tool. And see how to kind of work with uh, design the appropriate action uh, choice, action selection that you need to do, uh, and also see how we handle hard constraints, which is the time constraints that I was talking about. Uh, and particularly, you'll see that in our solution, we're going to use a, a double and dueling structure uh, on a vanilla deep uh, Q network, which is proposed about 10 years ago or 12 years ago now, uh, and, and see what the benefits it provides. Um, so I'll, I'll not get into too much details given the time constraints, but uh, uh, there is a interesting way we mix both action selection, which is which is uh, we know how to do with deep reinforcement learning, with existing ideas in the space. So before deep, deep reinforcement learning, there's a there's a, there was already existing ways to solve this resource, uh, sorry, this request crowdsourcing assignment problem, right? And that was the whole area of meta heuristics or heuristics. So the way we do it uh, is first use the DRL to choose a uh, at, at the granular granular level, a heuristic type, which is like doing things like insertions into the partial solution, uh, um, making some edits to the partial solutions, uh, edits to the routing solution, so, and so on. And then once we choose the uh, uh, heuristic type, then we actually uh, apply the heuristic explicitly to actually get the uh, full uh, fine grained solution. Okay, um, so. What are these moves, right? So, what is insertion? Just to give one example of uh, action selection. So, maybe the DRL algorithm chooses out of these eight types, it says that the uh, value function is the highest for the action insertion, and then we trigger a heuristic which goes on and says, okay, where can I insert a new request in the existing crowd sources, or should I use uh, one of the new crowd sources that are still available in the system? So, that is a heuristic, and that's just a uh, search problem. Okay, so that's not related to machine learning, uh, and so mixing these two helps us uh, get the benefit of both worlds. Um, beyond that, I want to just tell you a couple of details that we train. Uh, I, I'm going to show you some results where uh, we train with this action selection choice and a couple of other things. Uh, we train on multiple uh, multiple days. Uh, days are broken down into, let's say, hour, chunks of hours. And in each hour, you can think of it as an episode where we're trying to construct a solution. And while constructing a solution, there's going to be multiple uh, uh, action selections. Okay. So, uh, yeah, time constraints. I'll not have details. Uh, you know, time to talk about the details. Uh, but the the hard constraints. How do you solve it? Right. So a very simple natural idea is to make the hard constraints soft and impose a penalty, and that's what we do. Uh, and there are many ways to impose a penalty, uh, including keeping the hard constraint uh, hard, uh, which is you know you just ensure that the uh, time is always uh, kind of enforced at any given point of time while searching for a resource to crowdsource match. Uh, sorry, request to crowdsource matching. And the other two approaches uh, relax that constraint and impose a penalty. Okay, and we're going to see how this also influences, helps us deal with the constraints, and, and that was not naturally there in a vanilla DQN, uh, sorry, deep learning, um, deep reinforcement learning approach. Okay. So he, I'll just directly jump to the solutions. Uh, of what we do, we are thinking of a city scale solution, um, and uh, there's some details on how many requests we're getting per, per, uh, you know, uh, uh, per. Episode, uh, or sorry, per period, and how many uh, cloud sources we have per period. Uh, you can see that here, and this kind of reflects a kind of a medium-sized uh, city. And you can see here uh, on the uh, in the figure on the on the right, uh, we're just showing uh, the performance of 
our training using this uh, enhancement in the action space and handling of constraints on 30 randomly chosen days, uh, where these bars just represent uh, the, the cost of applying that solution. And uh, these three bars just represent the three different ways we have handled the hard constraints. And so lower is better. And we can see that you know there's some variation, but one of the approaches, one of the ways to deal with hard constraints uh, does better than the other two. On top of that, uh, this idea of using enhancing DQN, which is the most popular one uh, with Atari games and so on, to something like double DQN and also double undulating DQN extension, uh, how much uh, impact it has. You can see the green bars are uh, considerably lower compared to uh, the other bars. Uh, and so that's the enhancement we get uh, by judicially choosing the algorithm choice as well. Um, we have some additional experiments uh, which go into how much better this is compared to other heuristics. So as I said, this, this problem has been solved by heuristics before. So why, why the need for ML and AI techniques? Uh, well, uh, here's the solution that, uh, here's the evidence that you know, we can actually improve in terms of uh, costs. Okay? Uh, on top of that, we have done it. Uh, we've tried to make the uh, results as realistic as possible. Uh, and so here we are show just showing in these, for example, on the plots on the left side, uh, you can see the variation in the demand as a function of time. And even with this time varying demand, aggregate demand is what I'm showing here. Uh, we can show that uh, our blue bars correspond to our approach uh, is considerably lower uh, in, in this snapshot of 25 uh, examples. So uh, you may ask, like, why are you doing heuristics and uh, you know bringing AI tools? I mean, this is just an optimization problem. Why don't we just solve it uh, using a solver? Uh, and the answer is you can't use a solver like uh, like Cplex or Groovy or any of these integer programming solvers. Okay. So here is an example. We have just you know the smallest, the, the biggest example we can actually solve reasonably is with two or three crowd sources or four and seven requests. It's not city scale. It's not even at the block level, perhaps. Uh, and uh, and you can see already that we actually have we actually um, are not that bad. That's the only evidence we can show that how bad our heuristic is compared to that. But we are not able to solve uh, the the problems that I presented using uh, uh, well known uh, optimization approaches. Okay. So with that, let me just conclude. Uh, um, so what we show here is uh, the use of an AI tool, in particular, deep reinforcement learning framework within which a specific tool was used. Uh, and enhanced uh, using, uh, you know, by us defining an appropriate action space and mixing up with heuristics. And then also a way to tackle hard constraints that were part of the problem. Uh, and so we uh, also saw that the doubling and the dueling nature, uh, additional mechanisms to the DQ and algorithm uh, help. And uh, there are a lot of extensions that we can do, but this is an example of a study where uh, there's this foundation uh, in terms of algorithmic as well as model uh, level. Uh, but there's this gap that you need to fill to actually uh, get it to re do really well in a real world application. So uh, with that, let me um, um, stop there. Thank you so much for your uh, attending. Thanks, Seja. That was really good. Uh, and thanks for sticking to the time limit as well. Uh, love the virtual background too. Mentally, I'm there. Honestly, <laughs> how are you guys doing? How are you guys doing? Can we can we get like a some engagement on the chat? Honestly, you guys have been awfully quiet. Uh, I can tell you the other stages, the other tracks are super chatty, super talkative. Uh, maybe you guys aren't in the mood to talk. Maybe I can share some polls. Um, but yeah, next up we have Michael. So if Michael's around, uh, we can get you on stage and. Whenever you're ready. Thank you for having me. Thank you for showing up. Whenever yes. You... Um, so this presentation is about advancing legal reasoning. Uh, it's the integration of AI to navigate complexities and biases in global jurisprudence with semi-autonomous arbitration processes or SAPs. So essentially, that means what happens when advanced generative AI critiques human judges. And so it's kind of a question uh, around, until now, we have to ask, who watched The Watchmen? In a sense, if you go to court today, 
you have a judge, there's an appeals process after a decision and the judiciary and the jurists themselves uh, by profession are the ones who govern and judge how well that's done. Uh, the paper, uh, this particular paper about SAPs is about given the advancements in large language models or LLMs, we actually distinguish uh, at the level of chat GPT 3.5 as an LLM and call things beyond that capability ALMs or advanced language models. And given the fast paced nature of the field, this is one of the critical elements around how we're taking a look at how this is affecting the legal profession generally. Now, what are the implications? So we ran a study and one of the key findings of this particular paper lies in a human AI disagreement around biases and tax laws. So we had two AIs, one named Shirley and one named Sam's. Shirley analyzed cases individually from Rwanda to Sweden to Hong Kong in both Cantonese and in English, as well as uh, in, in the U UK and the US. And one of the things that was found as it analyzed sense of humor, sarcasm, among 40 other different types of features was that when Sam analyzed all of it globally, or rather Shirley's ratings, what we found was that Shirley and Sam picked up on a very interesting case around biases given how tax laws are interpreted. This is to say that essentially what we have here is AIs identifying uh, a strange case of very strange, well, rather strange behavior happening around how jurisprudence is administered or practiced. And so where do we go from here? Uh, when, when trained appropriately using various prompt uh, engineering techniques, as covered in this paper, ALMs have the potential to provide tremendous value uh, that was not imaginable uh, with instruction-based machines just a year ago. And when I say instruction-based machines, I mean, if this, then that, while this, then do this, uh, deterministic in a way. And all on our uh, staggering, but directionally coherent uh, journey as times change rapidly through AI advancements, we're going in an interesting direction. The direction is challenging how the legal profession will operate. Uh, we may have an opportunity to step outside the box and actually examine how justice is be being administered globally. And I'd like to thank you for your time. I know we have uh, time limitations and for more information, I suppose you could uh, read the paper. Thank you very much.
Hey folks, sorry. Uh, Ashman, you're up next according to the queue sheet. Are you good to go? I'm gonna call you on stage anyway, put you on the spot. Awesome. Looking good, but can't hear you. Okay, this should be good. Okay, uh, just a sound check. Am I audible? Yeah, perfect. Loud and clear. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I hope my presentation is visible. All right. So um, the paper that I'll be presenting today is uh, called Delivery AI, uh, which is basically a distributed path sharing network that we developed using reinforcement learning. And it was tailored particularly for the food delivery problem. So uh, for those of you who will be interested in reading the paper, the archive link is already provided here. So if we talk about the basic problem statement, uh, the idea is that the food delivery problem basically deals with assigning and allotting vehicles to pick up food deliveries from the source and uh, deliver it to the consumers who are the destination. Now, generally speaking, this problem is NP hard, so it is computationally very expensive. And there are multiple objectives to accomplish, which are often uh, acting against each other. Like a lower delivery time might go against uh, minimizing operational costs because it might require more number of vehicles, more manpower, fuel consumption, et cetera. Additionally, there are also challenges regarding synchronizing food deliveries and with the food preparations across different restaurants. So the kind of problem that we picked up to solve in the food delivery problem was to optimize order bundling. So uh, for those of you who don't know about order bundling, it's basically about bundling up orders that are going in the same direction so that we can utilize the same resources like vehicles and manpower uh, to deliver them. And the potential problem that we analyzed with it was that order bundling was mainly done at the source and they were debundled at the destination, which we felt was quite suboptimal because deliveries can actually be bundled and debundled dynamically throughout their path. And for the purpose of this, we developed this concept of having hotspots or hubs throughout the city where deliveries can reach intermediately and decide whether they want to be bundled with other deliveries. So on the right here, we can see like a typical case where we see that if the blue delivery and the green delivery go to their destinations individually in a single vehicle, they end up consuming more fuel, but they are delivered quite optimally and quite quickly. On the other hand, uh, the solid lines represent a sort of a path sharing network where these deliveries can actually meet at uh, the point number four labeled here. And they can go to the point number six together thus saving like 900 meters of distance just through a single vehicle. Now, formally speaking, our objectives were basically these three ones, which are quite intuitive. We want to minimize the total distance that's traveled by all of the vehicles that are owned by the delivery firm. And this will aid to minimize fuel costs, manpower, operational costs, etc. We also want to minimize the number of delivery vehicles because we don't want the delivery company to be unnecessarily having excessive resources when it can do with less. And on the left, all of the objectives are actually with respect to uh, the commercial aspects of making deliveries viable. But on the right side, we have something related to consumer satisfaction, which is minimizing the delivery completion time because we wouldn't want that the deliveries make so many hops they travel such a long distance that the consumers don't get a timely delivery. Now, the solution that we had to this was to develop some sort of an overlay network. Um, as I had talked before, that we need some hotspots or hubs where these deliveries can 
intermediately come during their paths and coordinate whether they want to share their path with other deliveries or not. So we call this fully connected click of hotspots as our overlay network, which is placed directly on top of a city. So on the right, we can see here, we uh, took the city of Chicago with its consumers and its producers, and then we divided the city into some cells, which I'm going to talk about. And then within each of these cells, we placed a hotspot. Now, the cells that we have divided into are basically census tracts. For, so for those of you who are not familiar with that, census tracts are basically administrative units uh, in which the whole city is divided. And according to the Census Bureau, they have at max 8,000 uh, residents. So we felt that this is a very appropriate um, unit area where we can have one hotspot that can cater to all the residents in that area. Then we have vehicles basically that are plying between these hotspots, hopping from one hotspot to the other hotspot till they are reaching the hotspot of the consumer. Now, we found out that reinforcement learning is basically a very, very adaptive kind of an algorithm that is quite suited for this. The motivation behind using reinforcement learning to solve this kind of a problem was twofold. First was, as I've talked before, that vehicle routing problem in general is very computationally expensive. And reinforcement learning actually offers a computationally efficient solution. The second reason is that we have a multi-objective optimization here, where a lot of the objectives are often conflicting in nature. So we need to find out a Pareto solution where uh, we need to optimize one thing at the cost of the other. And again, literature has shown that reinforcement learning is quite good at this. So basically modeling, uh, what we did was that um, we modeled our agents as these hotspots that we had placed in the city, where each of these agents was actually specialized and trained in delivering to a particular destination. So say there's agent two is responsible for hotspot number two, which means that all deliveries that are to come to hotspot two are um, carried out by agent two. And here is like a typical example of path sharing where we can see that the packet D1 and D2 need to go from their producer to their consumers. And in between is what we have the, is the overlay network. And our proposed model basically finds out uh, the path that is labeled by the red lines instead of the deliveries traveling by their own individual shortest times. And how this is controlled is by a twofold mechanism. First is the agent training, which happens largely using reinforcement learning. And the second part happens using the agent interaction part, which is largely deterministic and relies heavily on the agent training. So coming to the first part where we are actually training the RL agents. So as I talked before, our agents are nothing but these hotspots where we have, we have plates in the city. And we are training them using a very simple algorithm, which is Q-learning, um, the equation for which is already mentioned on this slide. So basically with Q-learning, what we have is that we are trying to optimize or learn a Q function, which is basically taking an input of a state and giving out the best action that needs to be taken. So as with a typical reinforcement learning problem, we have to define a few things like our state space, action space and our reward schemes. So talking about uh, our action space is again our these hotspots. Standing at any particular hotspot, the next hop can be to any of the other hotspots in the city. And that becomes our action space as well as our state space. So we try to keep the action and the state space quite simplistic because we wanted that this uh, solution should be generic for every city and there should not be any need for hand engineering uh, the action and state space for a specific city. And talking about the reward scheme is something that we are going to see uh, very soon in this presentation. So uh, when we talk about the rewards, we want that the agents should learn to reach the final destination as quickly as possible. And that's the only reward and penalty that we keep for training the agents. 
So whenever we are training the agents for every hop that they make, we give them a negative penalty of the time that they take to make that hop. And for reaching the final destination, as usual, we give them a huge reward that allows them and motivates them to reach their final destination. Once we have this kind of a queue function set up, we move on to the agent interaction procedure. With the agent interaction procedure, what we do is that we utilize the independently learned queue values of these agents and find common acceptable solutions. Now, what this means is that any two deliveries that are within a particular range of each other, say one kilometer, uh, communicate with each other about their preferred action set. That preferred action set gives out their most commonly used or their most preferred hotspot they would like to next visit. And if these two deliveries have something in common, then they'll try to share their paths as long as they can find a common action that is acceptable to both of them according to the Q values uh, that we learned in the previous step. So again, this is a very good illustration to depict how deliveries dynamically change and um, combine as well as decombine with other deliveries. So we can see like a four stage procedure here where we have a particular hotspot and two deliveries say D2 and D3, which are in green and yellow, they are arriving at a hotspot using the same vehicle. Now using the queue function, the green and the yellow delivery decide that hey, we cannot no longer share our common path because our paths diverge from here. So they decombine, that is they debundle themselves. And the green delivery communicates with the blue delivery, which was also arriving at this hotspot. And they both decide that it is feasible for us to share the vehicle because we have common actions in our preferred action set. And that's how all of the next stages of the particular hotspot with these deliveries moves on. So talking about our data, um, I would like to keep a particular emphasis that unlike a lot of the RL problems and solutions that are there in the literature, we chose not to go with a standard uniform grid-like structure because, uh, well, in reality, we don't have a very uniform grids. However, we did not want to stray away a lot from the grid world. So we, as mentioned in the first slide, we made our own grid world of the Chicago city and where each of these grids, instead of being uh, hand engineered by us, we took them to be the census tracts that are already available through the Census Bureau. So on the right here, we have the city of Chicago divided in, into its census tracts with the hotspot placed in each of these census tracts. And on the left, we can see a close view of the census tracts where we can see that the cross indicates the placement of the hotspot. So we place the hotspot at the centroid of all the producer and consumer locations, which are marked by these blue and red dots respectively. So deliveries from the producers will reach their nearest hotspot. They will follow our agent interaction procedure through the overlay network of hotspots and finally go to the um, destination, which is the consumer. So for the simulation setup, uh, we used real world data uh, from Graph Hopper, and we ran multiple simulations over 60 minute durations. We're using various kinds of policies and different kinds of delivery loads. And now we vigorously tested our uh, model. We additionally also constructed baselines, which are baselines one and two. I'd love not like to go into a lot of detail about them, but baseline one basically goes from a point to point delivery, whereas baseline two is just an ablation study where we do not do any sort of agent interaction and let them follow our overlay network independently. So talking about the key performance metrics, this is particularly very important because whenever we have a model, we need to judge how well it is acting with respect to others. So we devised these four key models, which are, might seem a bit too wordy, but they are actually very intuitive. Uh, they have a one-to-one -one relationship with our objectives. We are trying to minimize the total vehicle requirement. We are trying to minimize the delivery time. We are trying to minimize the distance. And we are also trying to maximize the success ratio, which is basically the deliveries that are delivered within their assigned time window. 
And just for completion here, I have also attached the results that we had obtained. And we found out that our delivery AI models were working very well with respect to the baselines. We were saving far above 12 to 13% with respect to the distance and the vehicles. But as expected, we were having an increased average delivery time because of the sharing and overhead of communication between deliveries. But at the same time, we were having a very high success ratio as well, maintaining well above 90%, which is what is expected from the delivery industry in today's era. So that will be all for my presentation. And just to sum it up, our delivery models work on independent queue learning through a multi-agent setup where we have a two-step process. Uh, the first involves the training of the agents independently. And the second steps involves the agent interaction, which happens based on the queue function we learned in the first step. And our future work basically involves in finding out multi-agent, core multi-agent and deep learning based approaches so that we can expand this ideology of path sharing across multiple cities and uh, states. So that we all on my side. Thank you for watching um, and listening to my presentation. Thanks, Ashman. Lovely presentation. I know it's 4 a.m. in India, and I'm terrified to ask you how many coffees you have to drink to still be awake <laughs> at this point. But thanks for having me. No worries. Uh, it's always a pleasure. Thanks for showing up, man. Thanks for showing up. And uh, just to round up, we have uh, the last two speakers to go, Viking, Gu, and Yu Han. Uh, and then we'll um, join the main stage where we'll be having the last presentation by Hanin. Uh, so yeah, Viking, if you're ready, we can call you on stage. Um, there you go. Awesome. Turn on your camera if you're comfortable to do so and unmute, please. And whenever you're ready, you can start presenting. Hello, can you see me? Hi. I think I already shared the screen, right? Can you can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. We can see you. We can see your presentation too. So whenever you're ready, you can, can get started. Okay. Uh, let me see. Okay, this one I'm going to start from beginning. So I came from uh, Daejeon. Uh, Daejeon means data to decision. Uh, we deliver trusted high accuracy AI solution through explainable machine learning grounded in geometric data patterns and empowered by large language model. And we, for example, can detect the seven diseases using 30 second voice data in high accuracy. So currently we have two known problems. One is the doctor spun out, one is patient to see doctor too late. It's not a preventive, it's a sick care, not a really health care. So currently approach is everyone start using collect the data, process data, find the black box model, deep learning, doctor does not as, accept. Everyone does this one. And we create the uh, basically geometric unified learning to overcome these five obstacles. One is the non-explainability. One is the high expenses because you need a lot of data to change. Even storage is big. Then also data uh, having a HIPAA and a, a privacy hoodles to go through so you can't get the data to change your big model and the time consuming of course the model we are drifting then a silo approach you only can detect the one disease at a time doctors say that they wouldn't want a 3000 icon on my uh, laptop there's no way for him to find them to test 
But do we have uh, uh, explainable machine learning? Yes, we have a traditional, for example, machine learning like uh, decision trees, random forest, uh, linear regressions, support the vector machine. But those methods is all based on linear algebra probability, multivariate calculus, which I, the subject I was teaching them when I was 18, I know they can't do well because simply, for example, if you have a digits nine, if it's a vector calculus based, the neural net basically is, uh, is uh, you know, a composition of a lot of uh, uh, affine functions with activation functions. So when you feed in, you feed in vectors. So the say this number nine, they pour into a vector feed in. But that means you broken the symmetry. That's very sad. But then you, that's why you can recognize them, but you need more than 20,000 parameters just recognize digits, digits zero, one, two, six to nine. So that's why we need much complicated technology. Uh, basically, we know data lies on low dimensional manifold and currently all the people treat the manifold, treat it as a trivial manifold, like a manifold, like in the middle one, this is like a, a, a paper, a piece of paper being deformed called the diffeomorphic get into a manifold. They are not actually true manifold. A uh, true manifold, you can, a sphere actually is a true manifold because it's not topologically homeomorphic to a point. Uh, all the this trivial manifold will shrink to a point. So therefore, uh, we try the in deep, uh, say, neural network. Uh, say, if it's a true manifold, if we wanted to use neural net, to approximate it, we did the simulation. The best one is the disk to approximate this data because they can't be written into one function. So we tried also even cut the half, uh, let it approximate, and it still can't uh, approximate well on this edge because by this edge, it's far from, uh, in your Taylor expansion, it's uh, many, many times. We developed the, uh, uh, data features, which is uh, have curvatures inside. You can fit it uh, perfectly. This is, uh, for example, data even have a concavity, concave, not a concave, it's uh, it, it usually uh, convex, it's easy solved. Concave, it's hard, but we still can fit perfectly. That's very important. If you have a tumor, you don't want to cut unnecessary health tissues. You do. You only want to cut the bad ones. Now what do people say is, wait, uh, traditional cannot do it. How about our transformer neural network? Yes, you can see. Let's look at this ones. You, you see each picture what's wrong. Maybe this is obvious. This person sits this way. There's no way the head turned that much degree. So this is like orientation problems. And if uh, deep learning works on medical data, problems you can see generated this uh, backbone is the front. Like this is it. You can't make mistakes like that in healthcare. Now this one looks very good, Champa. Who can tell me what's wrong with it? The, actually the problem with it is its length of the arm. His arm is too short. They don't have a geometry inside it. They just uh, have images chained. That's the problem. Okay, now let's look at the current most uh, advanced technology, uh, open AI's solar. Solar also having a, a, a put the a time, uh, it is a time space token used transformer and a lot of uh, other uh, transportations use probabilities. But at the last, you can see they are still pulling to a vector. It's a problem. So solar actually utilized time space tokens yet did not employ the global symmetric method. So what's that cause the problem? Let's look at this movie. Uh, you can see this, everything seems very true from just uh, uh, some text you can see when it's below the, below the, uh, the, 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 the uh, below the, the um, candles, the, the, the five frame stays, right? The air impact on the frame 
it's not actually uh, captured because because that token and the other token it's so far uh, they can smoothly connect the between they can't uh, 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 connect the very very close uh, situation. Look at that. Below, nothing happened, right? So this is something wrong. So candle flame remains statistic. Now the problem is why you can't solve it? Because this kind of a solution is obeys partial differential equation called the Mengjiang MPAP equation. You cannot use linear algebra such as numerical uh, analysis uh, uh, people usually proxy PDEs. So that's why it is the problem. So uh, what is SOLAR using? SOLAR using is basically probability uh, distribution, you know, encoder uh, go to uh, distribution, understand how they look like a Gaussian, then you can inverse back. Then you basically pick different data points, you use the variation autoencoder to make it. But this kind of a solution have a problems. The problem is that you can see here, they can generate the cheers, seems very smooth, very nice. Aha, the problem is this cheer, you can see, does not obey common sense that, uh, uh, which is visibly uh, looks like a, like a, like a, uh, the entire, entire thing globally does not make sense because it did not obey the physics. So uh, let's look at another problem. Uh, let's look at this 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 one. If you have a cup of juice, you will see this juice already spit out, then go down, right? They miss the crucial moment about uh, a realistic uh, uh, human perception uh, about the uh, critical moment of the juice spit out. They just uh, um, concatenated totally wrong. So that is preserve the uh, clear boundary between states during the learning process to avoid the pattern confusion. That's what we need. Uh, so, uh, so basically, current Sora does not know how to stitch local manifold patches uh, into a global data manifold and obey the physics. So, we uh, much unified learning. Uh, at the beginning, when I was looking at the word solar, uh, uh, not just the solar, uh, like uh, open AI's uh, mathematic background, I realized that if they don't use uh, big configuration space, embedded uh, dynamics, kinematics, or physics into it, you will have troubles like this one. And let's look at the, do we have unified technology? Yes, in physics, unified field theory in string theory, right? Einstein used the differential geometry, which is my field. My field is differential geometry. So I totally familiar with this uh, uh, background of Einstein relativity and currently unify one by adding a lot of techniques uh, using here. Uh, so uh, for example, like how you model things into this foliations, like a, uh, uh, this is definitely not Euclidean space. You have to look at the geodesics. You have to look at a much more complicated structure. And this is our base of GUL. So our GUL actually disrupt approach is basically understand what's the deep mathematics inside. Therefore, we create the new method uh, which explains the deep learning inside, and we actually created something new. We can replace a certain step of uh, deep learning, make it a much compact, a much faster, much accuracy. So you can see if we have uh, 30 seconds, a single 30 seconds of voice, we can detect uh, all these diseases uh, uh, in high accuracy, uh, uh, all of those, those numbers, in uh, accuracies, overall accuracy, and we have a uh, high, by this kind of high things, we our data also works unbalanced uh, data sets. Uh, so the precision, the uh, recall are very, very high. And why this works is because we treat the human body just like uh, 
UAV system. I worked on UAV system before, so it's it has dynamic system, uh, you know, kinematics. So we actually unify, you know, machine learning methods control because we don't want later AGI control us. We want to control AGI. We add the physics PDEs like PDEs. Uh, it's solving like the transport currently. The the transport is actually solving. Uh, Mongjiang Ampere PDE. And in my field as PhD, this, I develop a method which I can avoid some PDE, but I can very precisely uh, get the PDE solution. That's how the key thing, how it works. So uh, so my background is from UPenn. And luckily, uh, when I was getting my PhD degree in mathematics and master degree in mathematics, I went to uh, 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 UPenn's grasp map uh, worked with Dr. Kuma and the computer science information and worked with them. And this they, their time is doing this quarter rotor and all those quarter rotors they use matrix multiplication. But even in homogeneous space, it's a totally uh, mess. So I said we can use Lie group, Lie algebra. So we use the Lie algebra cal calculate very fast. So they let me write a paper together. That's why I accidentally also get a master's degree in computer science. Then I use this dynamics, key dynamics. My heart is really uh, focused on healthcare. So when I got a job, I become a, a tenured faculty at Harvey Medical College, I actually worked on uh, Q cancer use mathematics and published tons of papers. And our research was selected to present to congressmen. Like this one is the Illinois Conference the Congress. This is a South Dakota Congresswoman. We presented to them. So, so then our uh, uh, technology or research is being selected by Navy to work for them. And our research presenter on manifold is. Uh, just a grounds, you know, this is the left is abnormal, the right is normal. So that's uh, then we wrote the NSF ground and we got the funding and we be able to, we don't do any generative. Uh, if this is the patient's modern modality, we can pull all similar ones out without actually generate anything because the generator you always can, uh, in, in, you don't have enough data, you definitely goes wrong. Uh, so, uh, so that's what we're doing, and we also can use image data, like a combined voice, voice with image to detect the stroke. In this case, only uh, ten seconds, we already get very high accuracy. Currently, we use a voice to detect the various, uh, 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 various uh, uh, basically diseases, and our method overcomes the five big problems. Therefore. Uh, we be able to explain to patients and insurance. We can do early detection because uh, the pattern uh, very clearly showing it starts to develop all that disease. Then we do only prevention, then only monitoring, uh, patient only monitoring and the drug development because you can see from the pattern, if you take this medicine and your disease is is, is treated uh, so therefore you get better, move towards more healthy pattern. Uh, so um, uh, so this is the details uh, of the our solutions uh, value probably uh, value probabilization, explainable efficiency integration because one 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 uh, method can explain similar diseases. That's what the doctor wanted to see because no one will have one disease, uh, uh, just the one disease. It's usually take several medicines, have several diseases and the cause and effect. So we actually use the cause and effect to understand what's going on. So we also solve a privacy problem because we first will extract the characteristics, use fiber bundle characteristic class concept to extract the characteristic uh, 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 points. Those points, use those to form a data. But once you uh, extract it, it's only 2% of the crucial data being being extracted. Therefore, it will auto de-identify these patients. No one can recognize what he said. It's just a pattern. So that's why uh, 
we can auto de identify data to prevent a privacy issue, and that there's no need to move data out of hospital, which is a big deal, then uh, works for small data and uh, ethnic group. Uh, so 2% uh, of the data compared to this box is just this small. All those data don't need it. Just use this one. So it's also more accurate than deep learning. So here's my team. I wanted to thanks to my team, work with me, and we have uh, 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 those avatar uh, teams, and those avatar teams work for us 24-7. They do a great job. I really love them. And uh, uh, my background, like I said, I... I, I graduated UPenn, then I also uh, worked for various government industry. I was a clinical director, uh, being a couple of decades, so I have a lot of uh, uh, relations, uh, uh, networks uh, in healthcare, so, um, so that's why I'm familiar with what the, their pain points, uh, what do we need to resolve. So, uh, uh, being this one, I wanted to thank you uh, for your time and uh, for attending this conference, and uh, thank you for inviting me. Any questions? Uh, um, you can actually uh, basically contact me either through my email or through my cell phone number. Thanks, Viking. That was very well presented and promoted. Uh, on to... <laughs> On to the last speaker. I think we're going to hit a perfect 10 uh, with Yuhan. And I'm being told that this was the only track uh, where we've had 10 speakers, I guess. So we're doing really well. Um, Yuhan, whenever you're ready, I'm going to call you on stage. Awesome. You know the drill. Unmute yourself. Um, open up your camera if you're comfortable to do so and start presenting whenever you're ready. Hello. Hi. Uh, one minute, I'm uh, finding my slides. So while Yuhan gets ready, I'm also being told that uh, the closing ceremony starts in about 13 minutes. Um, and I'm guessing there's going to be some uh, awards or presentations that are going to happen. I'd also like to point out that we've constantly been uh, having like the highest viewership out of all the different tracks. So I don't know if there's going to be a, a, a prize for that, but we're definitely doing really good. Um, Please stay on and stay on for the closing ceremony as well. That begins in 13 minutes again. Like, uh, Johan, I hope you uh, find your slides. If you have any trouble presenting them, uh, feel free to mail them to us. We'll be happy to. Oh, there you go. Awesome. Cool. I'll leave the stage for you then. OK. 
Uh, hi everyone, thank you for having me. My presentation today is a survey type of research. The paper title is Unveiling the AI and Large Language Model Trends in the Pharmaceutical Industry. My name is Johan. I'm currently reading the field in University of Oxford. And you can find the archive link here if you feel interested to know more. I will introduce the research in those several sections, the motivation, methodology, and the results. And we have also divided the results into several sections based on the nature of the industry, including R&D, clinical and hospital, manufacturing, quality control, regulatory affairs, and other areas like logistics. So we all know AI is uh, the hottest topic across the world right now. And many researchers engage in research level, including many of today's presenters, as you have heard today. And at the application level, people also use it across various industries, whether to leverage its power for improving uh, the work routine or to seek assistance in generating new ideas uh, for, you know, for innovation. So this research specifically delves into AI and large language model review for the pharmaceutical industry. So you may ask, why do we focus on this area? Why do we want to research pharmaceutical industry? Because uh, we all recognize that the pharmaceutical industry holds significant importance for human well-being. And uh, you can see the data on the presentation the global pharmaceutical sector make a direct contribution of 500 and 32 billion US dollars to the world's GDP. And given the ongoing pandemic, this figure is anticipated to be much more than that. And when the industry producing high quality pharmaceutical compounds, we uh, observe that this industry encompasses several key sections. R&D emerges as a vital where scientists dive into discovering better molecules and the uh, developing product products. Manufacturing is equally important. Uh, after testing production, um, they, they will go scales up and leading to the creation of final dosage forms such as tablets and other dosage forms. And after that, regular affairs assumes a pivotal role. Uh, including interaction with authorities like FDA and China's NMPA, Japan's uh, PMDA, to ensure compliance um, to go to the market. And lastly, they have uh, like hospital and clinical sector where the product can actually uh, go to the end users, uh, which is patient. So let's dive in the research right now. Um, to review the current trend systematically, we look into two main databases, including IEEE and also PubMed. And we set the time frame from uh, 2019 to 2024, the past five years, to catch the most up-to-date trend. And we use a systematic review method, and we use multiple search strings in those databases because um, the industry, including many sectors, as I mentioned before, so for example, we use pharmaceutical and artificial intelligence or large language model and a topic, and topic including the, the uh, strings I mentioned before. And we also apply industry knowledge and divide the topic into more refined subtitle. For example, r &D may include animal study, uh, clinical trial, and uh, the drug discovery. So we use multiple uh, substrings and to uh, try to catch the whole picture of the industry. And finally, we got paper of 7,402 papers. Um, as you can see in this figure two, uh, we can see each section, the paper amount. We can see uh, most paper emerge in R&D uh, compared to the other sections. But we can also see the emerging sections, for example, regular affairs and document intelligence, AI chatbots, uh, also emerging significant, significant areas. 
And then we do a further quality check. We filter the paper and pick high quality paper in, uh, in this table too. And we also give each article many labelings. For example, uh, the section of the pharma industry, uh, where the country, the researcher, the research conducted, uh, the technology applied, uh, whether it's a more technology, uh, te technical paper or it's an ap uh, application paper. So based on this labeling and those data, we draw an alluvium diagram, uh, as you can see in figure three. Um, so this figure can let us dig more interesting, interesting things in those studies. For example, we can see uh, regular affairs section um, are using NLP technologies. And if we read those uh, citation paper deeper, we can understand why this type of technology are used in this specific chain. As researchers, they intend to use it to analyze regulations and streamline regulatory process to improve compliance and uh, make everything more efficient. We also try to use different visualization methods. For example, uh, we use word map. From this, we can see the semantic preference of research conducted by uh, scholars in different countries. Uh, we could see it, it is a pronounced concentration of R&D efforts in um, as you can see, it's in the orange part uh, in China and the United States, highlighting these countries are key players in driving innovation and advancement in the pharmaceutical sector. Additionally, we can see the blue part, uh, blue and green, the Russia and Australia, they emerge to be a uh, hot, hot hype hot hub for manufacturing, indicating their significant contributions to uh, manufacturing section. And in Canada, in the yellow part, in Canada, there is a um, emphasis on clinical phase, clinical and hospital, uh, reflecting country's focus approach uh, towards these two sections. And meanwhile, um, India, we can see India is uh, identified as a pro prominent center for research in quality control. So this trend underlines India's commitment to ensuring safety, efficacy, and reliability of pharmaceutical products. Then we will dive into each section and look into what research are going on. In R&D, there is a fascinating world of um, drug target uh, prediction and drug drug interaction. Um, there are famous models such as um, RASPIGET, IDDI, DNN. Um, they try to uh, predict the inter interaction between drugs and their uh, intended targets, foster more effective and safer uh, drug development. Um, and then we got target identification model. There are tools developed like uh, GFI, RDKit, uh, SKLearn. So there are tools powered by machine learning classifiers. And if you feel interested, you can uh, find the citation and find the, the citation paper to, uh, to read more. Um, in pharmacy world, there is a there is a drug formulation. Um, so basically, this area of finding optimal combination of um, inner materials and SPNs and APIs, and there are more breakthroughs uh, uh, happening in uh, preclinical research and clinical trials. Um, innovative approach utilizing NLP, the natural language processing, and the multi-model techniques. Uh, come into play. And these technologies help predict the success rate of clinical trials um, and providing valuable insights for more informed decision making in drug development. And then we have, we go next section, the manufacturing and the quality control. Uh, they're also both a pivotal part in pharmaceutical industry. 
and we can find a lot of footprint of AI in this industry, for example, in the predictive controllers in cell culture processes. Um, these models employ predictive controllers to ensure optimal cell growth and product yield. You may also wondering how AI systems are transforming energy management in pharmaceutical production. Uh, this system, this system optimizes dying process by uh, dramatically adjusting parameters based on real-time data. So this is not only leads to efficient energy use, but also uh, ensures the maintenance of product quality and contributing to reduced waste and a more sustainable uh, manufacturing practices. In quality control, scientists use real-time measurement in coating uh, sickness by machine vision and deep learning. Uh, These technologies analyze visual data for uh, defect detection, ensuring that the only high-quality medications reach end users. Um, What's more, uh, machine vision techniques are implemented for robust quality insurance. For example, in template matching process. And also they have techniques for automated inspections, uh, which can reduce human error and maintain consistency in packaging. Uh, next section, I'll talk about something about uh, record affairs. Record affairs is a section uh, when company they deliver their technical and also uh, other documents to agency, uh, and you may also call authority, and the agency will review the contents and give a uh, company next direction. So this where document intelligence play a role. Uh, is powered by uh, language, large language modeling and NLP. So using these techniques, large, large volumes of relevant data can be managed easier and ensuring compliance with global standards. And AI is now uh, being applied for automatic compliance, calculations, monitor, and prediction. Uh, this involves the incorporation of analytics and blockchain technology to remain data integrity. And also we can see a trend AI frameworks are playing a pivotal role in automating routine work in the um, PV, uh, thereby enhancing drug safety monitoring and adverse event reporting. Um, in biomedical research, researchers are deploying uh, LLM chatbots to navigate the vast landscape of medical literature and patient data. These chatbots prove uh, invaluable in addressing complex medical queries, aiding in di uh, diagnosis and di uh, dialogues between doctor and patient. Uh, the last section is uh, other supporting areas like supply chain. Um, the utilization of blockchain uh, can be found in um, the way we manage and secure flow of the products. This innovative approach ensures greater uh, traceability and security. And also uh, we can see laboratories are now leveraging AI to analyze biological samples, such as urine samples, to enabling faster and more accurate diagnosis. And this marks a uh, important leap forward in efficiency and precision of lab, lab tests. Um, and also uh, we can see AI in medication information extraction, use NER and RC in clinical document analysis and also uh, uh, I remember if I didn't remember wrong, uh, researchers from India, they apply machine learning for drug sales prediction 
uh, using different algorithms to employ for the uh, to foster the sales. Okay, let's wrap up here and thank you for listening. And if you want to uh, get to know more details about this study, please check on the archive link. Thank you very much. Uh, I will stop the presentation. Thanks, Johan, for presenting. That was a lovely presentation. Uh, we can now move on to the closing ceremony. Let me just say that it was an absolute pleasure to host you guys. Uh, see you guys in four years, maybe in person this time. But yeah, thank you. In case you don't know how to get out of this session and join the closing ceremony, just hit back. You'll see it on your screen. Just hit the back button and you'll see the closing ceremony and it'll be going live in the next two to three minutes. Thank you.